it is still a mystery how the grouper know when to move to the spawning site. They usually will show up in January, February, and sometimes in March. Most years, almost all, if not all of the spawning will only happen in January or February. While at the aggregation site, the Nassau's display a variety of color phases. The Nassau grouper regular coloration is that brown and white barred pattern with the big saddle at the back. Then there's white-bellied, and that's typically taken on by Nassau grouper both on their home sites and out there during spawning when they're over white area or they're up in the water column. It's basically a backlight camouflage. And then there's black and bicolor, and those are the two colors that fish are almost exclusively in when they're releasing gametes. Spawning occurs between one to eight days after the full moon. At this point in time, it really is a mystery. We do not know what it is that they are sensing, but clearly they're smart enough to sense something because they spawn on particular nights. One theory was that spawning may be influenced by the currents. To test that idea, the scientists used satellite drifters to track the movement of the water which is basically a big sock that hangs down in the water and it's tethered to a cable with a big ball on the surface. And in that big ball, there's a satellite phone and there's a GPS. And every 10 minutes, that satellite phone just sends us a text message and says, here I am. By deploying those on the aggregation when the fish spawn, we could see what the potential path is for the babies as they're leaving the aggregation. And we did this for three years on nights that they are spawning and nights that they aren't spawning. And what we found was that on the nights that the fish aren't spawning, the trajectories kind of go off to the north or to the west or sometimes to the south. And the nights after spawning, they kind of go off to the west or to the north or to the south. But on the nights that the fish spawn, the current patterns change on the aggregation site so that the fish are spawning exclusively, as best we can tell, on nights where the ocean currents are working to keep their babies close to home, which is right here on Little Cayman Island. The fish larvae typically drift around the open ocean for 35 to 40 days. And after that, the juveniles try to find suitable habitat and some people think that they can actually hear the sounds of waves crashing on reefs and things like that and they can orient towards that so they know which direction to swim and then they'll come in over the fringing reef and they'll look for small areas where they can hide and grow and that's sort of the two things they need to do is eat and not be eaten and so for their first year or two of life they may be in these really shallow areas and then as they grow they tend to move offshore into deeper habitats until they become the adults find their way out to the aggregation and repeat the cycle all over again. I think based on what we saw earlier today and the fish, the behavior, the way they were acting, it's gonna happen. There are definitely a lot of courtship behaviors. The large females that are very hydrated with eggs, you'll actually have a group of males that will follow her around and nudge her and try and encourage her to go up and release her eggs. So we actually see that herding or shadowing behavior. And it's almost like they're harassing her into going up. And finally she says, okay, I'll go and do it. And then she, you know, that's when she'll shoot up and then those males will follow her. You'll see spawning start to happen about 10 minutes before sunset and then it really starts going gangbusters right at sunset it starts to become a, a melee. So you'll get a reasonably large individual releasing gametes and you may have as many as 40 or 50 bicolors following at the same time and releasing this giant burst of gametes as they move up into the water column. When you start the dive, your visibility is over 100 feet. Towards the end of the dive, it's more like 20 and it's because you're swimming in a sea of eggs. It'll push on until about 20, 30 minutes after sunset. And right at the point where it's truly dark, all the fish will just drop down onto the reef and find a hole to hunker down at night. They'll usually spawn for three nights and then they'll go home. And it'll literally go from several thousand fish to no fish. They were there, they were, they were rocking and rolling. Very cool, very, very cool. There were just spawning bursts everywhere you looked. It was amazing. 
Several of the divers collected eggs released in the spawning burst with a plankton net. And if you look very carefully in there and there and there, you can see those little pearlescent drops, and those are eggs. And the cup's full up to there with eggs that we just collected off the spawning aggregation. We're hoping to be able to go through and do a genetic study on these eggs and figure out how many different females are out here spawning. We can then come back and look at all our juveniles that are around the island and see whether or not the juveniles are related to the adults out here. For several years, the scientists had searched the shallow areas for juvenile Nassau grouper without success. Then, in 2012, reports came in that little grouper had been sighted close to shore. So we said, let's try and catch some of those juveniles so we can get genetics from it. We can see whether they're related at all to the fish that are spawning out there and maybe close that loop to say, you know, you protect the fish out there. That will then result in fish coming, coming back to your own reefs. To locate the small young grouper, snorkelers cover a wide swath of shallow water. Once they see a fish, the GPS location of its hiding hole is recorded. Okay. Next is the rather difficult task of trying to catch the little grouper. Once a grouper loses the chase, it's brought back to the boat to be measured and have a fin clip taken. And what that does is allow us to analyze the DNA. Genetic data collected previously from across the Nassau grouper's range indicates that fertilized grouper eggs can travel long distances. Preliminary results are suggesting that there's a lot of genetic exchange between populations. So even with the work that's being done on drifters showing that, you know, there's a potential for larvae to be retained close to shore, there's actually a lot that are being taken in currents to other regions in the Caribbean. The question of whether or not there are larvae coming from other places to here is a tough one to answer. The only real link that's been shown for the Cayman Islands is between here and the southeast tip of Cuba. We don't think that there would be a lot of import of Nassau grouper into this area. Upstream of here in Jamaica and word out of Cuba is, is that there's just not enough Nassau grouper left there to expect decent amounts of larval recruitment here from those locations. Given the low chances that grouper larvae from other islands could make it to Little Cayman, experts feel it is all the more important to protect the local fish with hopes that they will replenish and sustain the population. In the eight years since we've closed the Little Cayman site, we've seen an increase of about 1,500 fish. That's not a lot of fish. On average, they reproductively become active somewhere between five and seven years old and they'll live anywhere from 20 to maybe as much as 30 years. And because it takes quite a while to get to that reproductively active stage, recovery, once conservation efforts are put in place, can take quite a while. The research is also suggesting that larval recruitment, or the number of larval fish that will survive and settle in shallow water, is very sporadic. We can go many years where there's no recruitment or more very little recruitment. And then you may get one year where there's literally hundreds of NASA grouper that show up in the inshore seagrass beds and nearshore reefs. Knowing this, scientists are suggesting the implementation of more stringent, long-term fishing regulations. The Department of Environment has been using the science to come up with a management recommendation that we feel will work for the long term. And what we believe we need to do is establish a closed season during the spawning period. So where fish cannot be taken anywhere within our territorial waters. So that closed season would run from November through the end of March. And that's what we've proposed to government. The DOE is also recommending that all the known spawning sites around the Cayman Islands be closed to any fishing year-round. We've seen a number of species aggregating there to spawn. So we think that they're important areas generally for fisheries around the island. The other thing that we're trying to do is to give a realistic, sustainable 
catch limit. So we're thinking that it would be one to two fish per person per day, which is a low number if you're used to catching 60, 70 fish a day on the aggregation, but we believe that's what we have to do. We're not about stopping fishing, we're about ensuring that this can go on for generation to generation. While there is no commercial fishery for Nassau grouper in the Cayman Islands, there has been some opposition to the proposed legislation by artisanal fishermen. In East End, they would salt the grouper and eat it very traditionally at Christmas time. That's one of the things that a lot of the fishermen talk about is, is losing their tradition and their heritage. But the majority of people now definitely feel we need to have these sites closed. And these islands, nobody's starving. They don't have to depend on the grouper to feed their family. There's plenty of jobs, and if a man want, wants to uh, make a living, he doesn't have to make it from, from catching a grouper. Caymanian native Bruce Eldemeyer has seen firsthand what intense fishing pressures can do to fish populations. I was a commercial fisherman in the state of Louisiana for 26 years, and we wiped out the redfish and the trout over there and I know what it's all about. You've got to have restrictions and laws to protect something like this. The time now is to step up that arm protection to be able to protect them for, to protect them and, and, and um, you know, into perpetuity. To create greater awareness of the issues surrounding Nassau Grouper, the DOE and Reef have reached out to local schools to share their research findings. We're doing lesson plans that focus on the ecological importance, but also the cultural heritage of the Nassau grouper and being able to make that connection so that they can see why it's such a special thing to protect. Living in the Caribbean, it's very important for these students to be aware of the issues that are going on around them. I mean, I knew there was grouper holes, but I didn't really realize how important the spawning was and how catching that much of them could lead to a depletion of their stocks. In 2012, the scientists started live video web chats from the spawning aggregation with students in classrooms on Grand Cayman. The students get to ask real scientists that are out in the field about what they're doing and how they're collecting their information and their data. Here we are, coming up on the Nassau grouper. There's a whole heap of them out here, as you can see. And these fish are ready to spawn. Got some big friendly females. Bryce, the question is, how many eggs does one female have? It's certainly thousands and thousands of eggs. The bigger the fish is, the more eggs that fish produces. a lot of fish down there. I can't believe that we were able to share that amazing experience with everybody across the web and in the classroom. The future of Nassau grouper in the Cayman Islands looks hopeful. Scientists have worked tirelessly to better understand the lives of these amazing fish. Now they hope that their scientific findings will lead to permanent protections for this endangered species. For many generations, our, our forefathers have eaten grouper as a cultural tradition. And so to continue that tradition, we want to be able to protect them so our children can see what groupers are, can take part in that heritage as well. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. And by Divers Direct, inspiring the pursuit of tropical adventure scuba diving.